I think a lot of the abuse and the violence on women comes from this idea of what manhood is, of what masculinity is. I think we're socialized to look at gender as two binaries, a man and a woman. This is how a woman is treated. This is how a man treats a woman. This is what it means to be a man. This is what it means to be a woman. And if we're socialized that way, then we're just going to keep doing it as we get older and older and older. Street harassment, going outside, I'm feeling comfortable in my body and just having to cross the streets when I see folks um, that I know is going to say something to me. A lot of times I don't want to leave my house just because I know there's still someone talking to me. It's just traumatizing and emotionally draining. It looks very differently every single day, but it happens every day. A lot of the pushback against my work comes from men who say, but there's nothing wrong with that, that it's a compliment. They really believe that this is how they are supposed to act towards women and that to push back against that is to be challenging the whole system. And it is a challenge to their manhood, it is a challenge to their masculinity because what they've been taught that masculinity is, is dangerous, it's violent. It is the reason why women are dying every day at the hands of men. Women are afraid to say no to men on the street. We're afraid to turn them down because they might literally kill us. Why? Why do you feel so entitled to a woman's body, to a woman's sexuality, that you will literally become violent towards her? There have been potential demographic changes in our country in which the traditional hegemonic white man um, is on course to be the demographic minority in this country. By 2025, white populations and white men won't be the dominant group. And so I think that there's a lot of anxiety around that issue. Part of the issue with the classic definition of toxic masculinity is that there's no other skill set other than acting out or acting aggressively. If you're anybody else in American society, if a person of color, a person who's deemed different by gender orientation, society tells you how to act. You can't walk down the street without being put in a particular box. And the illusion of toxic masculinity always is white men can kind of do whatever they want. The fear is going to be with that sense of authority and autonomy, white men really never develop skill sets in a toxic sense other than acting aggressively. I think the fear is that when they became the demographic minority, they might have to actually cooperate or collaborate with other kinds of people, which is an opportunity to make a better masculinity. But instead of that, what we're seeing is a lot of aggressive behavior. I can be like human and, and talk. <laughs> and I don't have to worry about anything. It's just this is nice. <laughs> the whole idea of what toxic masculinity and what role it's played in uh, the political climate and also the culture of violence that we live in. I wouldn't say that the, the presidency was like the main factor. It's something that existed, but really kind of put it out in the front. And it also kind of normalized the conversation around it and, and made it okay to demonstrate how you really feel and your attitude, particularly towards women. One candidate in particular kind of demonstrated uh, masculinity in, in multiple forms. A bullying behavior, name calling, and kind of really kind of playing on somebody's level of masculinity and how they kind of show up and present. So that kind of really sent a message that that's where America should be, right? It's probably a little bit more covert, but he made it overt, and so it really exacerbated the idea that it's okay to kind of speak this way and behave in this way. I think we, we're paying a price for it right now. The message that it sends to young people, and the message that it sends to adult men as well, you know, this is okay, if the president can do it, then we have license to do that as well. So I think it really sent a really negative message around what it means to be a man, and then also what it means to, you know, kind of survive and exist in, you know, in this present culture. I gotta use some Tic Tacs just in case I start kissing her. Now I'm automatically attracted to beautiful. I just start kissing them. It's like a magnet. You just kiss. I don't even wait. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the pussy. I can do anything. We're at a very interesting and obviously a very complex and often dangerous cultural moment. Part of the context, of course, is a presidential candidate who succeeded despite voicing some incredibly toxic um, beliefs about sex and gender and male power. I don't want to sound too much like a chauvinist, but when I come home and dinner's not ready, I go through the roof. It's the most salient right now for white masculinity because it's just the most 
public in, in relation to politics, mass shootings. This is a real moment of opportunity for white masculinity, not just to project and lash out, but also to rethink the ways that men act. This idea of machismo uh, that has been relatively similarly construed, this idea of being tough, of not paying attention to your own body, of acting in a way that on one hand is socially rewarding, uh, but on the other hand is um, is detrimental. We don't want to make a blanket kind of cultural assumptions about the ways cultures are, but white masculinity seems to be kind of in first place right now in terms of its, its toxic performativity. It's a toxic conversation that's happening. To get to a level of misogyny even being a problem is, you know, can be tough sometimes. I don't think masculinity is, is automatically something that is, is, is negative, but it's something that definitely has to be uh, controlled and, and, and harnessed. I think toxic masculinity plays itself out in terms of um, being aggressive, you know, with women in general. What's really vital and important for people who are harassed is to be having conversations about our own resistance and how we can care for each other. Changing the dynamic of street harassment in a neighborhood also means that the people who do harassment have to stop doing it. And the conversation around how we organize men really does start with a conversation about masculinity because in a patriarchal society, masculinity is one of those things that it, it's so ubiquitous that men don't even know that they have it or that they do it. The other place where toxic masculinity is coming up quite a bit is in real acts of aggression like mass shootings where we're seeing a lot of male frustration that's linked not just to attitudes or behaviors but also about firearms. And it's a moment where I think masculinity has a choice. Does it want to become more collaborative and cooperative or does it want to lead down this toxic path that's going to lead to terrible ends for itself and for everyone else. And now we're really learning how it wasn't just the person that did the, uh, the sexual um, you know, violence. It's like, what about the, the environment that kind of protected or colluded with the person who was doing that? Of course, it's about men in particular using their power against women, but then also it's really about the people around them that kind of supported or silent around that. And that's who I'm really trying to target because I think they're the ones that can really make a difference in the future around um, these things from, from happening, right? It's really about holding people accountable, holding men accountable with compassion. A great first step is to have a conversation because so much of living in a patriarchal culture, so much of living in rape culture where it's okay for women to be harassed and sexually violated, is that oftentimes we're not having conversations about what this looks like. People who are harassed will walk around feeling really badly about an experience that they just had, and allies or view harassment will often not intercede and really don't even have conversations with men and other masculine of center people about what it looks like to intervene. So really the very first step is developing and creating an awareness. And then from there, I think folks will be really surprised at how generative a conversation is and how much can really come out of a conversation for how we need to be doing this work. You know, I don't know what it's gonna to take to make men not be sexist or to not violate women or to not hold these ideas in their head that they are entitled to women. But I do think that a man can be sexist all he wants in his mind. But I think in order for us to change um, violence against women, we have to make it not okay for them to act these things out. Even though they may want to, even though they may still look at women as just sexual objects and don't really care about them or their feelings, maybe now they'll think twice about it because there will be consequences. When it comes to sexism and it comes to rape culture, it's like we have to call these dudes out. And I think that happens by telling our stories and calling for action. But I think we're witnessing this movement happen where women are just kind of becoming unafraid to say what it is that they've gone through. You don't have to 
be yelling at a woman down the street to still be sexist. You don't have to be grabbing women and abusing them to still have some part in it. Like you do, we all do. And you as a man living in a society that is misogynist, that is a patriarchal society, it's just, it's bound for you to have some sexism within you. You're just socialized that way. You just gotta step up. And yes, it's difficult. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's uncomfortable, but you have to do it. You have to do the work. Nobody respects women more than I do.